Uh, Mike is doing a uh, PhD at the University of Twente. Uh, I was visiting them and they have such a nice group. Uh, I mean, a group not at the PI level, at the whole uh, department level or something. And I invited her to give this talk because he is such a good speaker and you will see it yourself. So, Mike, uh, uh, we are recording this session just for uh, your knowledge. And the floor is yours, so please. Um, okay, great. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, but it's not in full screen. Oh, oh yeah, of course. I need to... Um... Yeah. Can uh -huh. you see my cursor as well? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you, Abbas, for the uh, invitation, first of all, and thank you all for um, being here this morning. I'm very, um, well, happy to talk about my uh, project today, which is joint work together with um, Richard Boucherie and Marie-Colette van Lieshout from the University of Twente as well. Um, yeah, so um, as you can see from my title, uh, my talk will involve uh, the easing model and also mark of decision theory. So what I first want to do is just give a little bit of an introduction into both of these topics such that you, um, well, if you're not familiar with them, such that you can make a sense of the rest of my talk. Um, yeah, so starting with the easing model, the easing model, you may have heard of it. It's a very famous model in uh, statistical mechanics. Um, and it was originally designed to serve as a model of ferromagnetism. Um, so it is defined on a graph. Uh, this can be any type of graph, really, but um, in our project, we just look at the easing model defined on a lattice, like in this picture over here. Um, yeah, so in the easing model, um, uh, yeah, so we're looking at the lattice. We call this lattice lambda, uh, capital lambda, um, which is the set of sites, which are also called spins in the uh, literature on the easing model. And each of these spins can be uh, in one of two states. They can either have the state minus one or uh, plus one. Um, and we denote the state of a, a spin k by sigma uh, k. And the entire configuration, so all of these states, all of these spins together, we call uh, sigma. Now, there can also be uh, a magnetic field imposed on the lattice. And we assume that this magnetic field is just constant for each of the spins. And this constant we call h. Um, now, each of these configurations has a certain energy. This energy is given by the following function, which is called the Hamiltonian. Um, and this you can see from this uh, function. So this first summation ranges over all uh, neighboring spins in the easing model. So as you can see, if you look at this expression, um, configurations in which spins are aligned with their neighbors and which uh, in which they are aligned with the magnetic fields, these configurations have a lower uh, energy. Um, now the probability that you find some configuration sigma in the easing model uh, is given by the following uh, distribution, which is called the Gibbs distribution. Um, so it looks like this. So Z is just a normalizing vector. That's just, um, uh, well, nothing to worry about. Uh, this beta is a parameter. It's positive, and it's called the inverse temperature. And this uh, H is the Hamiltonian that we saw before. So um, yeah, as you can see from this distribution, configurations that have a uh, lower energy have a higher probability of occurring. So basically, uh, this distribution favors configurations in which more spins are aligned with their neighbors and also um, with the magnetic fields. So the easing model basically, uh, in the easing model, spins tend to align with their neighbors and also with uh, this external magnetic fields. Um, now, we're interested in easing models that um, evolve over time, so dynamic versions of the easing model. Well, there are several different uh, types of dynamics, but um, in our project, we're studying the so-called metropolis dynamics. Um, and these have the following forms. So sigma superscript i is the configuration that we get from flipping a spin at site i from a configuration uh, sigma. And given this notation, 
uh, the metropolis dynamics look as follows. So basically what the metropolis dynamics is doing is it picks a spin uniformly at random from the lattice. And um, if flipping the spin would result in a configuration with a lower energy, then we flip the spin with probability one. And if flipping the spin would result into a configuration with a higher energy, then we flip the spin with a probability that is given by this um, exponential thing over here. So um, yeah, these are the dynamics that we assume the easing model is uh, evolving according to. Um, so what we want to do is we want to steer the easing model in a certain direction somehow. We want to uh, steer it, for example, towards a certain uh, target configuration using some external influences or some perturbations. Well, there are several ways in which we can uh, do this. So there are several parameters in the easing model that we can uh, adjust a little bit in order to get um, our into our goal. Uh, one of the things that is very natural maybe to do is to just take this magnetic field and to um, design a magnetic field that is based on your favorite configuration. And then um, you just put that on the lattice and you let the metropolis dynamics do their work. Um, and then what you can do, for example, is um, well, you can make the easing model behave according to uh, <laughs> our host. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, have <laughs> <Sorry>? <laughs> I have never been flattered this much. <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice configuration, right? <laughs> yeah, so what we did here, we just made a magnetic field based on the phase of Abbas, and then um, we uh, initialized the model from some random configuration, and then we made this magnetic field so strong that it just overrules basically all the neighbor interactions and then the spins will just nicely align uh, with the magnetic fields. Um, so yeah, so this is, well, this is actually very easy. This is just basically overruling all the neighbor interactions. So this is not um, uh, that interesting in that sense. Um, so what we're interested in is models or settings in which um, the decision maker doesn't have such a strong magnetic field at his disposal that he needs to, um, well, so that he needs to find more sophisticated ways in order to get the model to behave uh, as he wants. So this is where um, Markov decision theory comes into play. Um, yeah, so if you're not familiar with Markov decision theory, I'll just give a very um, brief overview of the basics such that you can um, uh, well know everything that you need to know. Um, so in Markov decision theory, basically Markov decision theory is a theory that is concerned with um, decision making over time, so sequential decision making under uh, uncertainty. So um, the setting typically is as follows. Uh, we have a certain decision maker who observes a system at a certain time t. And um, the system can, for example, be in a state ST at time T. Well, after observing the state ST, the decision maker can take an action based on this state. So he takes um, action AT, for example. Um, and then after choosing this action, there are two things that uh, are happening. First of all, um, the decision maker receives a reward, RT. And this reward is based um, both on the state ST and on the action AT at time T. Um, and also the system will transition to the next state at time T plus one. And um, this happens according to a transition probability that uh, depends on the choice of this action. Um, and then at state or at time T plus one, the system will be in the state ST plus one and the decision maker can again take an action, et cetera, et cetera. And this process just continues until um, the end of the time horizon. Um, so this is called a, a Markov decision process, this framework. And um, to formally define a Markov decision process, you need to specify five elements, which are uh, here collected in this tuple. So first of all, there is a time horizon, a set of decision epochs. Um, for today, we just only consider infinite horizon processes. So in this case, um, uh, the set T is just the entire set of positive natural numbers. Um, then we have a state space, which collects all the possible states that the process can be in. 
Uh, then there's an action space. There can be different action space for each different state in the state space. Um, and then there are transition probabilities. So these specify the probability that at a certain time t plus one, you will find the system in a state S prime, given that at time t you were in a state S and you uh, selected action A. And then finally, there is a reward function that um, just gives the immediate reward after choosing an action A from a state S. Now, of course, um, the aim in a market decision process for the decision maker is to uh, choose his actions in such a way that he receives the most reward, of course. So um, in order to do so, he needs to decide on how to choose these actions somehow. Um, and this behavior of the decision maker is um, defined by so-called decision rules. Um, well, there are several different types of decision rules, but uh, for now we will just look into deterministic decision rules. So a deterministic decision rule is just a function that takes as input a state from the state space and spits out the action that the decision maker is supposed to um, take in this state. Um, then if we just use the same decision rule for each point in time, then the result is a stationary deterministic policy. Uh, this we call pi. So this is just using the same decision rule um, at each time t. Um, and now the goal of the decision maker is to select this policy, is to choose this policy in order to generate the best possible sequence of rewards. Well, there are several different ways in which we can define the best possible sequence of rewards. Um, one, uh, one of them, so the, the objective that we're looking at is um, that the decision maker wants to maximize this uh, quantity over here. So this is called the expected total discounted reward of a policy pi, uh, which we also call the value of a policy pi in a state S. And what this is really is this is just the expected value of all the rewards, the sum of all the rewards that the decision maker receives until the end of the time horizon. And these rewards are discounted by a factor lambda to the power t. So lambda here is just a number between zero and one. Uh, and we call this number the discount factor. Um, and the discount factor is basically, by choosing a discount factor, you basically choose um, uh, how much value you assign to rewards in the very far future as compared to rewards in the in the nearer future. So if lambda is very high, um, then you care a lot about the long-term uh, profit of your strategy, whereas as lambda is lower, then um, you care mostly about the short-term uh, rewards. So this is a way of um, making a trade-off between long-term and short-term uh, short uh, rewards. Um, and now we call the policy pi star optimal if it maximizes this expression. So if its value function is greater than or equal to the value function of all uh, other possible policies that we can choose. Well, there's one very classic result in market decision theory that I just um, want to show you. Uh, so this theorem says that a policy pi star is optimal if and only if it satisfies this um, set of equations. And this, um, so these equations are called the Bellman optimality equations. And these are really um, fundamental in market decision theory. They, they really lie at the basis of many um, algorithms and results and whatever. So, um, yeah, so basically, this is saying that uh, in order to find the best strategy, the best policy, all we need to do is just, um, well, just solving this um, set of equations. Um, yeah, so that was just, uh, is this clear so far? If, yeah, just interrupt me if anything is not, not clear. So this was just very um, briefly an introduction in uh, Markov decision theory. Um, yeah, so what we are interested in is decision making uh, on processes like the easing models. So in processes that are defined on graphs uh, and which evolve according to these neighbor, neighbor interaction structures. Um, so what we did is we um, uh, formulated a special type of Markov decision process, namely the spatial temporal Markov decision process, we called it. Um, and this is basically a subclass of the class of MDPs, Markov decision processes. 
So um, yeah, if you look at it, it looks very similar to the definition of an original MDP. It just has one extra ingredient, namely a graph. Um, so an STMDP is defined on a graph uh, with a vertex set V and an edge set E. Um, and each of the vertices of the graph now has its own state space, SV. Um, and the Cartesian product of all these uh, state spaces is called the configuration space now. Um, and one, the one characteristic of uh, an STMDP is uh, a special requirement on the transition probabilities. So um, yeah, I left out the mathematical details here, but basically what it boils down to is that the transition probabilities are defined by these neighbor interactions and also by the decisions of the decision maker. So um, yeah, what I mean by this is basically that if you look at this graph, for example, at this red vertex, then um, the probability that this uh, vertex transitions to a next state only, so for one time step, only depends on the action of the decision maker, first of all, and on the previous configuration, but only on that part of the previous configuration that is defined on um, this uh, section of the graph. So only on the configuration of the red vertex itself and um, that of its neighbors and not on the, uh, the rest of the graph. So that's really the characteristic that distinguishes the uh, STMDP framework from, um, well, the uh, normal MDP. Um, all right, so yeah, so armed with this framework, we can again uh, look at the easing model. So what we wanted to do is manipulate the easing model. Um, so we say now that we have the following uh, setting. So we have a decision maker who can flip a spin every n time steps. And by flipping these spins, uh, he wants to steer the model to a certain target configuration sigma star, for example, the base of Abbas. Um, yeah, to do so, we can formulate to find the optimal policy here, we can formulate this problem as uh, an STMDP. So uh, yeah, if we want to do that, we just uh, need to specify each of these elements of the STMDP framework. So first of all, we have a graph. We assume that our graph is just a lattice lambda. It's two-dimensional and n by n, and it has periodic boundary conditions. So this means that the boundaries of the lattice are uh, connected. So we are on a torus, basically. And then there's an additional node, which we call the clock node. And um, well, this is just a technicality, actually. This just keeps track of the time until the decision maker can again decide to flip a spin. Um, we have an infinite horizon process. So this is the um, set of decision epochs. The state space of a vertex in the lattice is just the state space of the easing model. So we have minus one or plus one. And the state space of the clock node is just this set of numbers from zero, one to n minus one. And the clock node just increases by one each time step. And if the clock node is at zero, then the decision maker can decide to flip a spin. So he can pick any spin from the lattice. So the action space is the entire lattice. And um, uh, and if not during this adjustment period, um, he cannot do anything. So that's the action that we call uh, zero. So actually after the decision maker flipped the spin, we give the process some time to adapt to this new, uh, to this action, to this new configuration. Um, well, then after flipping the spin, after taking this action, the model just evolves according to these dynamics that we saw in the beginning. So these metropolis dynamics. So the transition probabilities are just specified by these dynamics. And then finally, we need to uh, select a reward function. So um, yeah, so defining a reward function that really reflects your goal is quite a challenge in general in market decision theory. So uh, yeah, in our case, we study two different reward functions. Um, this function R1 is just an indicator function that gives the value one if uh, we're in the target configuration and value zero otherwise. And this reward function R2 um, is the sum of the spins that are pointing in the right direction, where right is the um, direction of the target configuration, of course. Okay, so um, yeah, so now we have specified each of these things. So we form, we fully defined our uh, easing STMDP. So now we can um, search for the optimal policy. 
we can solve this, uh, this problem. Well, in order to do so, just to remind you, we need to um, find the policy that maximizes the value function. So this um, expression over here that we saw before. Uh, and we now, yeah, this is now decorated with beta and, and so the parameters of the easing model. And in order to find the value of uh, policy pi, we just need to set to solve this um, set of equations. Well, there are, um, so this sounds very straightforward. There are many methods and algorithms in Mark decision theory that just lead to the solution to these equations. Um, but there is one problem. These methods uh, typically don't work or they're, well, not tractable for uh, processes with a very large state space. And in our case, the state space is two to the power n squared, where n is the um, size of the lattice. So that is, of course, growing super large with uh, the value of n. So that is uh, a problem. This problem is called, uh, also called the curse of dimensionality. Um, yeah, so we needed some way to um, to solve this problem. So to solve this problem, we came up with we came up with two uh, ideas. Uh, yeah, actually, these are not really solutions to the problem, but more uh, a way to work around it, basically. Uh, so first of all, we decided to focus on the low temperature regime of the Ising model. So we sent beta, so beta is the inverse of the temperature, to infinity, um, so temperature to zero. And also we imposed a small positive magnetic field on uh, on the lattice. Um, yeah, and it will become clear in a bit um, that this setting is much easier to study from the perspective of decision theory than um, a general uh, beta and H. And also another thing that we uh, did is we reduced the state space to the local minima of the energy function. So what this means and why this works, I will um, get back to in a bit. Uh, but first, let's take a look at what happens if um, we send beta to infinity. So instead of finding this value function, this V pi, um, we looked for the low temperature limit of this value function. So the limit as beta goes to infinity. Uh, and also accordingly, we um, uh, took the limit of the uh, um, transition probabilities. Well, remember that the transition probabilities are um, defined by these dynamics, the metropolis dynamics, and this um, is the Hamiltonian of the Ising model, uh, just to uh, remind you. So um, what happens if we send beta to infinity here? Well, this term over here will just uh, go to zero. So if we send beta to infinity, then the metropolis dynamics reduce to this. So basically what's happening here is that um, the metropolis dynamics selects some spin uniformly at random. If flipping the spin would reduce the energy, then we flip it with probability one. And if flipping the spin would increase the energy, then uh, we flip it with probability going to zero. So uh, we don't flip it in the low temperature limits. And this, um, if you think about these equations for the value function, this means that all the uh, terms that correspond to uh, basically uphill steps in energy will just go to zero, they vanish. So that is, um, well, that greatly simplifies uh, the equations. So that is very, uh, that's very nice. Um, yeah, so also remember that uh, we imposed a very small positive magnetic field on the lattice. So H is small and positive. So this means that, um, if a minus spin is selected, then it will flip to a plus if it has two or more plus neighbors. And if a plus spin is selected, then it will flip to minus if and only if it has three or more minus neighbors. So that is um, something to keep in mind. So to make this a little bit more concrete, um, we call a spin I uh, susceptible in the configuration sigma if flipping the spin would lead to a lower energy configuration. So here um, I drew a configuration uh, on the dual lattice. So each of these squares represent spins and these orange squares represent plus spins and these white squares are minus spins. And this dark orange square is uh, also a plus spin, but this plus spin is surrounded by three minus spins. 
Uh, so these, these are four neighbors. Um, three of them are minus. So if it is selected, it will flip because that leads to a lower energy configuration. So this is a susceptible spin. Now a configuration in which, um, like this, in which there is at least one susceptible spin, uh, we call such a configuration fragile. And configurations that are not fragile, we call robust. So in robust configurations, all um, spin flips would lead to a higher energy configuration. So basically a robust configuration we can regard as a, a local minimum of the energy function. And now, um, well, if you think about it, if we give the process a long time to adjust to the flip of the decision maker, then eventually the process will end up in one of these local minima, in one of these robust configurations. Um, so what do these look like? Well, here you can see some examples of two fragile configurations and one uh, robust configuration. So these two configurations are fragile because, for example, this plus spin is surrounded by three minus spins, so it will flip with probability one. And also these spins are uh, surrounded by too many plus spins, so they will also flip. And in this configuration, um, uh, all spin flips would increase the energy function. So this configuration is uh, robust. And you can, um, so if you look at the Hamiltonian, then you will find that um, the only configurations that are robust are configurations that uh, consist of rectangles, like over here. Um, so actually, so um, if the adjustment time is long enough, the system will eventually just get stuck in one of those robust configurations. So these robust configurations really dominate the equations for the value of function. And the fragile configurations won't contribute that much if n is very large. So that means that for large n, we only actually uh, need to care about these robust configurations. So these configurations that um, contain these rectangles. So that is, uh, well, inspired by this idea, we built a new MDP, which um, we call the auxiliary MDP. And this is basically a caricature version of the original MDP. So this MDP, um, well, it behaves actually in the same way as the easing MDP, but it ranges only over uh, the robust configurations that have one rectangle. So um, yeah, I'll not cover all the details here, but um, we represent such a configuration just by the size of this rectangle. So ij corresponds to a configuration with a rectangle of size i by j. Um, and the state space of this auxiliary MDP is only um, ranging over these uh, sizes of these rectangles. And the transition probabilities are just approximations um, of the probabilities in the original MDP of going from a configuration with a rectangle ij to a configuration with a rectangle i prime j prime. Right? Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, so I prepared some slides on how to find these um, uh, transition probabilities, but I will just skip that part, I think, in the interest of time. Yeah, so if you're interested, we can maybe um, look at this uh, at the end of the talk. And I want to uh, yeah get to something more uh, interesting, in my opinion. Um, so for this auxiliary MDP that just ranges over all of those rectangles, we uh, actually managed to find the exact optimal policy. Um, yeah, so I just want to show you what these what this policy actually looks like. So for suppose, for example, that we have a configuration that looks like this. So we have one rectangle of plus spins and that we want to steer towards the all plus configuration. So we want this rectangle to cover the entire lattice. Well, and we want to know what the optimal action is in this uh, configuration. Well, we have we can flip any spin we like, but actually many of these spins do not really make that much sense because if we flip a spin that is in the middle of this rectangle, it will just flip back. And if we pick a spin that is very far away from this rectangle, it will also just flip back, so that doesn't really make sense. So the only reasonable candidates for the optimal action are really these uh, green spins. So if we flip a spin at distance one from the rectangle, then 
uh, we can possibly gain this entire side. We can jump to a larger rectangle. Uh, if we flip the spin at distance two from the rectangle, then we can gain either one side or uh, maybe even two sides. And if we flip a spin that is uh, diagonally adjacent to the rectangle, then we could um, well obtain a vertical site and a uh, horizontal site, or uh, one of them or both. So these are really the um, only uh, possible candidates. Well, we found the optimal action for each possible shape and size of this uh, rectangle. Um, so what we did basically is we started from the all plus configuration itself, so the largest possible rectangle. And we um, well solved the Bellman equations for smaller and smaller and smaller rectangles. So it's basically um, uh, a long induction proof, actually. Um, so this is the, so if we start from the all plus configuration, uh, we know that in this auxiliary MDP, we cannot escape from this configuration. So we know its value, it's just one over one minus lambda. If we go to a rectangle of size n by n minus two, so remember that our rectangle is so the boundaries are connected to each other. So it's a torus. So this um, square is connected to that one. So this is basically a strip that wraps around uh, the torus. Um, so in this case, we should flip a spin at distance one from the rectangle. If we have a gap of three, then we should flip a spin uh, in the middle of this gap. If we have a gap of distance four, then we should again flip a spin at distance one. If we have a gap of um, length five or larger, um, then we found some interesting behavior. So here we found a different optimal policy for uh, values of lambda that are uh, below or above some critical value. So remember that lambda was the discount factor in our MDP. So um, yeah, so if lambda is very high, then we care, um, then uh, rewards that we receive in the very far future have a lot of value still. So in this case, uh, we choose for a safe strategy. So flipping a spin at distance one. So we can gain only one side, but we have less risk of losing this spin and not gaining anything at all. Uh, but if lambda is lower, we care only about short-term rewards. So in that case, it's more favorable, it turns out, to take a more riskier strategy. So we flip a spin that is at distance two. Then we can potentially gain two sides, but um, that comes at the cost of a higher risk of losing all of our gain and just staying in the original uh, rectangle. Um, yeah, and we also found the critical value of lambda, which is 15 over 17. Um, then in a rectangle of n minus two by n minus two, we pick the diagonal spin. In a rectangle of n minus two by n minus three, we pick the spin in the middle of this gap. n minus two by some j less than n minus three, we pick the diagonal spin again. n minus three by n minus three, we go to the middle of this gap again. n minus three by some j less than n minus three, the diagonal spin. And for any uh, rectangle that is smaller, uh, the diagonal spin is again uh, the winner. And this, um, so this specifies the optimal policy for all uh, rectangles, all shapes and sizes. Um, and it also holds for um, every uh, possible lattice size n. Um, yeah, so just to conclude, I just want to show you um, some results, some simulation results that we uh, got when we, um, well, simulated different policies. So we simulated three different policies here. Um, so in the first sequence of frames, you can see what happens if you just flip a spin that is at distance one from the rectangle each time. So we first um, uh, grow the horizontal part of the rectangle and then in a uh, vertical direction, um, horizontal direction, oh, well, <laughs> to the right. Um, and then, so as you can see here, the adjustment time is not long enough to really grow to a full rectangle again. So then this is what, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the situation that you get if you flip a spin at distance two from the rectangle each time. So it looks very similar. And this is what you get when um, you implement the optimal policy. So this is, um, well, clearly the most efficient strategy. Um, yeah, and here I just plotted the value functions for each of these 
free uh, policies as a function of the discount factor. So the yellow line corresponds to the optimal policy and the other two lines are uh, the other two policies. So um, yeah, so the optimal policy clearly has the, uh, the highest value for each possible discount factor. Um, yeah, so here, um, yeah, a few key points from my talk, from our work. Um, I hope you liked it, hope you found it interesting and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. It was like much more than just saying it was interesting. Okay, question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks. That was interesting. So basically, because you set the temperature to zero, so now it's not a stochastic system at all. So I, I see assumption there that because this is an egotic, egotic system, so if you if you have randomness in in why 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 that temperature. Then, then on average, the opt uh, optimal policy would be the same at finite temperatures at, at, as at zero, or not? Um, sorry, I cannot hear you very well. I thought oh, really well, well, part well, of it. Um, I, I, I wouldn't like to shout. I mean, probably everybody would do. <laughs> Maybe when yeah. I'm using this one, so no, 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 sit and talk. All right. Okay. okay, let me know if you can't hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, if you speak yeah, loud can. enough, then. Yeah, because you said the. Yeah, understandably, you said the. So now I. Okay. But she can't hear it. All right. So you set the temperature to zero to make yeah. it easier. Yeah. Is the assumption behind that, that if you have a finite temperature when, when and then you have a uh, genuinely stochastic system, would the a policy, the optimum, po optimum policy, remain the same? On average, is that your assumption, or or you have no assumption about that at all? Yeah, that is very interesting, actually. So we can so actually for these uh, simulations, the temperature is um, uh, well a little bit higher than zero. It has to be a little bit higher than zero. Um, uh, so in this case, it still still seems to work out. At least this policy still seems to achieve the best results. So that's actually a very interesting question that we're yeah planning to look into so on how how small the temperature or how large the temperature can actually be for these results still still to hold. Um, yeah, because so now um, if we send the temperature to zero, then the probability that some spin flips if we're in this rectangle situation just goes to zero. But if the temperature is small, but still larger than zero, this probability will be non-zero, but still small. So yeah, I think we can uh, obtain some, um, uh, well, some upper bounds and lower bounds or whatever on how, um, on uh, the value function of our policy. But that's what we're, uh, yeah, looking into at the moment. I see, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I have a, a simple question. Hello, I'm Peter Olmer. Uh, Friend of Nelly Litvak, so we used to be in Tante. But... Oh, yeah. Anyway, so I, I wonder, like, if you take this, uh, the standard uh, uh, easing model and uh, you quench it to zero, so set the, the temperature to zero, then it, it would, wouldn't would kind of stop at the rectangles. It would stop at either everything is just white or black, or, or there could be like a band that goes around, we kind of call the domain wall. Those are the only uh, configurations that are are kind yeah. of like st stable to them. I'd say like your greedy form of metropolis. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so in um, this so what, is what, what is stable about the, the rectangles really? That's what I want. Yeah, so um, the only stable states really, if you have a small positive magnetic field, the only really stable state is the O plus configuration itself. And these rectangles, so um, in the limit of the temperature going to zero, um, well, the probability that the spin flips goes to zero, but it is uh, it is not actually zero. So it will you can show that eventually you will escape from um, such a rectangle. It's called a droplet, also in the li in the literature. Um, so the all minus configuration is uh, what's called the meta stable state, and you can show that uh, the easing model stays oh. in this uh, all minus configuration for a very very long time in a low temperature limit, and then at some point it will um, there will appear 
one of these rectangles and the rectangles will grow and grow, but this will, in a low temperature limit, this happens extremely uh, slow. Um, I mean, you're still talking about some small positive temperature because if it's really zero, then yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but we don't actually set it really to zero. We take it oh. to limit to zero. So it's not it's not equal to zero. It's just the limits of beta to infinity. Okay. Well, thank you. So in, the, in this limit, also these rectangles eventually also will um, cover the lattice, but this will uh, well take an exponentially long time actually. And we just assume that we have a finite adjustment time. So within this adjustment time, the probability that anything happens goes to zero. So that's why the values of these uh, configurations also go to zero yeah. because the value function is finite. Um, so this happens, um, this yeah, this flipping, spin flipping process happens much faster than uh, the process of this rectangle actually growing because that just takes an exponentially long time. Okay, I, I think I understand. So I have an, another question. So th this is, uh, I mean, the problem is very similar to game theory, and uh, uh, but but there they well they use a different language. Am I do, do have you seen some kind of translation between this uh, Markov decision making or um, game theory? I mean, what you yeah. would call like like uh, opt what you call optimal. Um, policy they will call like equilibrium strategy and like yeah yeah that's right yeah they're actually very related i think um i think the difference is in game theory there are uh, multiple players who like play against each other who each have their own strategy oh, yeah, that's right. uh yeah. yeah i'm not a game theory specialist so this is just <laughs> what i think game theory yeah, will that's, into. That, that's true yeah. but in decision theory there's only there's uh yeah actually only one player that just plays yeah. against some yeah. environment. One system, one player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're they're similar, I think. They use similar uh, things. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's come back again. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. I, I wish you were here and you could join us for lunch now. Yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah. Maybe in the future. Take care and thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.